the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab episode 744 for Monday, January 14th, 2019. Yeah, ratings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, the cool stuff we've found, the tips we've found, and we share everything we can, including answering your questions, kind of like car talk for Apple users, with the goal being that everybody, all of us, me included, him included, you, we all learn at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include LinkedIn Jobs at linkedin.com slash MGG, where you can save 50 bucks. BB Edit from Barebones Software at barebones.com and Cashfly at mac.cashfly.com. We'll talk about what each of those things means a little bit later throughout the episode. For now, here back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here back in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John Pro. How you doing, Mr. John F. Braun? Get back from CES okay? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Flights were uh, uneventful. Weather was uneventful here and there. Um, yeah, That's good. just winding it down as you are from uh, the chaos that is CES and the visual and every thing overload yeah it is overload <laughs> at least it, for me at ces but it, i mean that's the sort of the point right is it's you know this very compressed sort of thing that happens and everybody's there and we get to see all these great products and uh and and actually i want to take a minute and just thank our our three ces 2019 sponsors which is text expander from smile carbon copy cloner from bombic software and other world computing at maxsales.com they, you know, it takes a lot to cover the show and to do it right, because the point is not for us to tell you about everything that's there. That would be not only uh, I don't want to say impossible, but it would be probably worthless no, to you. It's impossible. <laughs> well, it would be possible, but it's we it would also be worthless. Like the point is to filter through it all and find the things that actually matter to all of you. And that's uh, that's what I think we were able to do. I think we did a great job with it this year, if I can pat us collectively on the back but um but we found some cool things i want to take a minute and kind of just talk about if there's any cool things you saw that that are standing out to you john sure let's bring them up but also just trends that uh that we saw there um that you know that there, there was nothing in my opinion there was nothing um overwhelmingly you know, spectastic there, right? It was all like, <laughs> right. You know, I mean, there was cool stuff for sure and cool tech being demoed and, and all that, but this wasn't a year where it was like, Oh my God, the entire world is going to change because of this, you know, technology that came out at, at CES or whatever. It wasn't that, but there were some yeah. cool things for and sure. We, and the thing is, that, uh, so the even, so CTA, which is the, umbrella organization of uh, CES. I mean, you know, I, I got to say, Dave, and uh, I hope they don't ban us or anything, but, you, you know, they had an event where they were telling us, well, here's what we think are the coolest technologies that are like going to creep up on you. And Yeah, at the beginning of and, CES, they do this trends event, right? And I don't know if I was necessarily... It, so they talked about, okay, AKTVs. It's like, to me, Dave, as an average guy... I'm still on 1080p and they were talking about 5G, which I'm sure will, uh, you know, the, the increased bandwidth and some VR stuff too. But it was, it was kind of like, a, my impression was like, they kind of all threw this together to kind of just get people excited, but none, none of them on their own was like something, as you said, earth shattering. So, so there are definitely advances in the yes resolution or quality of the technology, but as far as like a new paradigm or something like that, I, I, if anything I saw and what I noticed, I'll just go off script here. I, I don't have a script, <laughs> but you know, there, there were definitely, well, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about these, these trends because, and then, and then if there's anything specific, we, we each have to, to mention to our listeners here, let's do that. But, um, 8k TV. So I I'm, I'm with you. I think most of us will not, we won't have TVs in the next, few years anyway we won't have tvs that are big enough where 8k would matter 
However, you know, I always look at these things as not what it could do for me the way I consumed things yesterday, but what can it do to change the way I consume things tomorrow? And and I think all three of these technologies you mentioned can really can and probably should be looked at in that light. So with 8K TVs, I started thinking, all right, look, when we got more resolution on our still cameras, right? We went from, you know, one megapixel to two to four to eight to 12, right? As that happened, what what really began to happen was we could take, say, you know, a picture on our eight megapixel camera and crop it down, right? And still have a lot of good resolution. So think about that with TV. Wouldn't it be cool, even if I've only got a 4K TV or a 1080p? Actually, I don't even think the TV we have in the living room is 4K yet. I think it's just 1080p. Um, but uh, and it's a 60 inch screen, right? So what if I could take my 8K signal that's coming in and, you know, I'm watching, say, a, I don't know, you know, a football game or something where it's like, wait a minute, I want to see that play again and I want to zoom in on like the guy's foot or wh whatever it is. Could I do that? Like I would have the data to do that with 8K. And if the tech now that we have the data, now the tech might be able to evolve to give the home user like that sort of control and and maybe a company like like TiVo or, you know, Comcast with their set top boxes would do that. So that that's with 8K TVs like that bandwidth brings with it a lot of possibilities for things that we don't even think about doing yet. And that's just one of them. So, and you know, I'm, I'm actually with you on that because there have been occasions where I'm watching something in HD. Yeah. 1080, where, um, so my angle is a little different in that I love Easter eggs. Sure. And, in, and the thing is every move, almost every movie or cartoon or, or whatever, um, has little hidden messages, but you need the resolution to see them. And sadly in, a lot of SD copies of the stuff I have, you just can't see it because it's just not there. It's in just HD, not there. Right. Yes. And, and as you point out, um, if you want that detail, you'll get it from 4K or 8K. And um, exactly. You know, let's, let, let's stop there for a minute. And so, and, yeah. And so, know. so we've got that, right? And then 5G is sort of the same thing. It's like, well, you know, do we need our phones to download things faster? Well, I mean, that's always better, but. When we're in a decent signal area, like it's pretty good right now. Again, the tech that the the apps that we use, the use cases that we have sort of match the bandwidth that we have. So now you add way more bandwidth with with 5G. We all well, maybe we don't all know one big use of 5G is to replace your cable modem, right? Because you just put that you put a 5G receiver on your house. It can do gigabit speed, like true real world gigabit speeds fine. You don't have a cable coming to the house. That's now your thing coming in. Then you connect that to another wireless router, or perhaps it's an all in one box, like a cable modem, you know, residential gateway is now, and then it broadcasts your Wi-Fi in your house. So that's one use. Another use that they've talked a lot about is in vehicles and the smarter our cars get, I feel the better off we are. Uh, things like, you know, like right now I've, I've got a car that does lane assist, and uh, adaptive cruise control, but it'll it'll stop me before I plow into somebody. It'll actually nudge my car back into the lane. And it's doing all that just with cameras. Like it has no idea what the other vehicles on the road are doing. So add to that communication amongst all vehicles and it gets even better. Right. So five and 5G increases all the bandwidth. So now we can do things like that. Lower latency. So to me, that again, I'm looking to what what doors will this tech open up? Not what will it do for the thing I tried to do yesterday? OK, you yeah, know, I'm with you on that. Yeah. In the case of my vehicle, though, it's a threat to all that surround it. Yes, your vehicle. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah, no, truly. It, it really is. But and if you haven't tried out like this lane assist stuff or any of that like that, it, no, it's really it. cool. Yeah. And it makes you it makes it's crazy how much safer it makes you. And and again, that like that. So feeds if you right veer in. out of your lane, so it's looking at the uh, the, the the lines on the road, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And when it's if you cross it, it's like, well, that's not good. So uh, yeah, it'll hello. nudge. It'll nudge me back in unless I'm like Will pushing it across take it. Control. Yes. Which is probably a good thing. It's a good it's probably thing. Probably making the right choice. Computers. Computers are better. I'm. I will maintain 
that even today, and certainly it will get better in the future, but even today, computers are better driver than humans. Um, human, we humans are awful. Like, we, like driving is just not a thing that we humans are, uh, th- th- that we should be good at. We are distracted. We, we, you know, focusing like that on a thing is not, it's just, it's just not what we're built for. Um, we're built to think and, and like do things and driving is, oh, no, I'm is, with you. And I, yeah. and, and I think if I read the news properly, I think there has been one fatality attributed to yeah. a, uh, driverless vehicle. And there will be more, uh, unfortunately, a lot better. Well, it's a lot better track record than yes. people. Yeah, correct. <laughs> oh, wait, right. Exactly. Exactly. So, but this feeds into that AI thing, right? It's the same sort of thing. It's like, what can AI do for us? Well, you start combining all this stuff. We got higher bandwidth. We've got faster processors. We've got, you know, machine learning so that we have all this data that we can synthesize together and, and pull patterns out of. And now you don't really need a super fast CPU because it knows the patterns, right? That's what machine learning does is, mm. is you, right? For anybody that doesn't know, like that's my, my 10 second example of machine learning is it takes lots and lots and lots of data of fast CPU or a series of them crunches it all down into a series of patterns. And then you can have your much lower powered CPUs, you know, react to the, to the data that these fast mm. CPUs has crunched. And so again, with AI, like, you know, my car is doing AI as it nudges back and that, that sort of thing. Like this, is these are the good things that I think like those three texts will bring us. Is it revolutionary? Well, you know, if it saves your life, probably to you, it is, you know, <laughs> like, but is so it going to change the world? Huh, you know, no. Okay. I just want to mention one trend that I saw yeah. on the, uh, at the show and, uh, and it kind of dovetails off of what you said. I saw at least three companies that had monitoring systems that would use, I think, uh, and I think they used AI somewhere, um, but it was technology that was meant for caregivers. Mm. To know if somebody had maybe hurt themselves. Yes. And the demos were all compelling in that they would show a camera and it would pick up. It, it doesn't have to be complicated. Pick up a wireframe of uh, a person who is, uh, you know, not necessarily always taking care of themselves, but needs to have someone watch over them. And it would show one where the the stick figure fell over. And it like it was like on the ground, and it's like okay, well, I think I know what that means. I think I should tell somebody about this. Um, but there were like a, a, again at least three companies I saw that had assisted living technologies, if you will, that detected if something bad happened to somebody, and to take it a step beyond I've fallen and I can't get up because maybe you can't hit right. your little buzzer or whatever. So so it was really neat to see how uh, you know with our aging population. Uh, the community was coming up with solutions to, to, you know, help, you know, avoid disaster. I, I, I thought it was cool and that they all popped up like this year. I, I never really noticed the space until this year. So. It, no, you're right. It, it, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. One cool thing that I saw and I talked, uh, I talked about this on our daily observations podcast on, on Friday with Kelly and John, but, um, the, John Braun, I mean, you, not, not mm-hmm. Martellero. Uh, it is, but I'll repeat it here because it was, it was cool. And it is one of those things that you, I think we will see change stuff. There's a company called ultra haptics, which is using ultrasound for both control and feedback. And what, by that, I mean, the, the first demo I saw, they had like a, it was a sensor bar that was about the size of a large keyboard. Right. And you just float it, or I floated my hand in front of it. And then on the screen uh, in front of me, there was a little robot that appeared and I was able to sort of float it around in midair and, uh, and, and spin it and twist it and have it do these actions just by moving my hand without touching anything. And it was using ultrasound to sense where my hand was and how I was moving. Uh, and it, I could be very articulate with it, right? It was very detailed and very controllable. What was really cool was it was also using that same ultrasound to give me haptic feedback so I could feel resistance points against my hand. Now I could easily push through that resistance. It wasn't like it was holding me. I, I don't know if that level of ultrasound would be safe, but, um, but it was very much like the haptic feedback on my phone again, without me touching anything other than of course these sound waves. So that was amazing on its own. And then they sat me down in front of essentially a slot machine without any levers. And you interacted with it the same way touching and pulling things on the screen 
with one additional benefit that was also facilitated by the ultrasound. And that was that it used those ultrasound waves to monitor where my face and specifically where my eyes were so that once I sat down and it took maybe a quarter second to orient to me, it was projecting a perfect stereo 3d image at my eyes. So I, without glasses, I was able to see in full 3d on this screen it was super clear. It didn't matter how I moved. It tracked me just fine. It's really, really cool. So again, I mean, and they were using this uh, in some slot machines or in, in some casinos rather in Vegas already, but I could see this being very handy in the car again. You know, did you take your eyes off the road? Did your eyes close? Right. Like these things could be really important to know. Um, and should the car take over? Like, you know, did you fall, just fall asleep at the wheel? If so, like, let's, you know, let's let's fix that. Let's see if we can help the driver. So, again, you know, these things are it's cool. So I, I can't stop talking about that one. So there you go. Uh, you got anything, anything else specific that you saw there, John, before we kind of move out of CES? Um, in general, there were more smart home things yeah standalone sensors um and more people advertising um home kit which um i I would say got off to a rocky start well Um, apple reduced the tech requirements for home kit last year so it makes sense that we're finally seeing the chip or the security do you have detail on that oh yeah yeah no they they made it so that you don't need the chip anymore you can it can just all be done with software. They were they reduce the security requirements for a lot of different things so that so that thing so that existing hardware is able to be adapted for HomeKit. That's why we're seeing more and more HomeKit stuff, because they they kind of lowered that bar. Do you still need an Apple TV as the hub or you you would need? Well, n- no, you can HomeKit okay. direct from your you always have been able to HomeKit direct from your iPhone to a device in your house. Now, initially that device needed to have, you know, a super chip in it that could do elliptical curve encryption and all that crazy stuff. The Apple TV is if you want to control HomeKit when your iPhone is not at home, right? So you can trigger your Apple TV or, uh, or an iPad. I think an iPad can be a HomeKit controller or a HomePod can be a HomeKit controller. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. uh, So, yeah. Do it work. Yeah, it's cool, I, but you know, but I like, I'm kind of with you. I, I, I'm not, it, time will tell, but at this point, like I don't prioritize home kit and the stuff I buy. I know. And I know many listeners do, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when home kit came out, I already had a lot of devices, none of which were home kit compatible. And I was like, well, I'm not going to throw all this stuff away and I'm not going to well, limit- with me. I'm in the, uh, the a world for the most part and the, uh, wink world. Yeah. Those are, are the two worlds and they do everything I need. And if you got a controller, you could also be in the mm. Google assistant world uh, because most of the right. stuff that works with the Amazon a lady also works with Google assistant, you know, so, and Google assistant's cool. That's, that's actually, well, it depends for like home automation. I think the, the a lady is the best of the three main voice assistants for getting information. Mm. Google Assistant's the best, without question. It's, I mean, it's right. so good. Well, I would say that any product that advertised being a home product would have those two listed as yeah. the top contenders, and maybe HomeKit. And then maybe, home, I agree with that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. All right. Fun. So CES was worth it. Thanks to all of you who kind of followed along with us while we were doing this out there. And, and of course, thanks to, like I said, our three CES sponsors, Text Expander, Carbon Copy Cloner, and Other World Computing, because uh, it all, like we all made it happen together. And, and that's a beautiful thing. So I do want to take a minute and talk about uh, our first sponsor for this episode, which is LinkedIn Jobs. Uh, I've been employing people for a long time, and I can attest to the fact that the right hire or the wrong hire can make a huge impact on your business. I have hired the right people, of course, thankfully more often than not, but I have made the wrong hires before because I didn't have enough options to choose from. And man, like that makes it, you got to have enough options to choose from. 
And this is where LinkedIn has what I like to call their unfair competitive advantage, because there's people out there looking for jobs and they might be on all the regular job boards in addition to LinkedIn. But the people that aren't looking for jobs are still on LinkedIn. In fact, 70 percent of the U.S. workforce is on LinkedIn all the time. So by posting your job on LinkedIn, you're actually getting in front of the people that might be not be looking for a job, but are perfectly qualified for you. And those might very well be the people that you want because you want the people that are qualified for role for your role and maybe looking for something that they haven't seen yet. So LinkedIn is the place to do this. And that's why a new hire is made every 10 seconds using LinkedIn. Here's the cool part. You can go to LinkedIn.com slash MGG and you get $50 off your first job post. I have actually made a hire based upon someone that I found within that first $50 of spend. So like, don't think that this is, this is valuable here. Trust me on this. That's linkedin.com slash MGG. You get $50 off your first job post. As I said, linkedin.com slash MGG terms and conditions apply of course. And our thanks to LinkedIn jobs at linkedin.com slash MGG for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, let's go to uh, our first quick tip for the day, shall we? We have quite a few of them here, if I can get my stuff together. You with me, my friend? Okay. You got it. I'm with you. All right, cool. I know where you're going. All right. Uh, Scott Scott brings us in. He says, uh, under Safari on any iOS device, you'll see the little two squares icon in the lower uh, right-hand corner on the iPhone and the top right on the iPad. This will let you manage your tabs, right? If you tap it, you can see all your tabs and you can switch to one or do whatever you want. But here's the thing. If you hold down that button, it'll give you an option to close all of your tabs. And some of us might be surprised to see the number of tabs that it's offering to close because a (laughs) lot of times... I think I, I did it with I'm not going to point out which of my family members, but uh, but there were over 200 tabs open uh, mm-hmm. on a device at one I, point. I which, What's I, that? I think I know which one? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that you do, actually. But uh, but there you go. So, yeah, it's a, that's a cool tip. I, I it, and, and this is the beauty of quick tips. I use this all the time. As I mentioned, I've already pointed it out to family members. That was before Scott's email came in even. And I don't think I've ever thought to mention it here on the show. So there you go. My guess is it's either Hector or Lisa. So here's the thing (laughs) is that today, January 14th, is Hector D. Bird's 26th birthday. (sighs) So happy birthday, Hector. Yes, I think one of our friends pointed this out online. Yeah. His yeah. former uh, master. Oh, is that right? Did somebody else point it out? I know Lisa was pointing it out today, too. But uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, Magnus did. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. And I still remember it was not only an iron beak, but an iron wing. I still remember a reference to an iron wing. I may be hallucinating. I don't know. It's possible you're hallucinating. You did just and, come and back I from Las think- Vegas. So <laughs> anything's possible. Well, yeah, I mean, your 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 uh, time space reference is always altered when you go to Vegas. That's correct. But anyways, um, I thought I saw the reference and he, he thinks so, too. But anyways, right. the other thing I want to bring up here, Dave, is not only in addition, if you hold down on the little square thing, you get something um, extra. But did you know? So you see the little bookmark icon. If you click on if you hold down on that. It'll bring up a thing saying, ooh, add bookmark or add to reading list. Isn't that amazing? And then if you hold down on the left pointing arrow on the bottom left of the screen, and you hold down on that, it brings up history. I did not know this, but I was hearing this tip. I was like, you know what? I should try every other icon and see if they do anything. So here's a tip, folks. You got extra time on your hands? <laughs> just hold down on every icon and just see what happens. Yeah. Then you can send us a quick tip. And you know, you could do that, Dave. You could send a quick tip to feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I believe you said feedback at MacGeekGab.com, John. Yes, I did. We mentioned it once before, but I just wanted to make sure everybody knows 
feedback at MacGeekGap.com is where you send your obscure tips. Or not obscure tips. Really, like these are these seem obvious to to many of us, but we know they're not obvious to everyone until you know they're obvious. So that's they're the obvious if fumble fingered. Yeah, like we all do, but right. sometimes it just works to all our benefit. So, anyways, speaking of feedback at macgeekab dot com, if you wanted to search for email from a specific sender, Todd points out. Uh, in Apple Mail, when you click on the down right arrow to the to the right of the or the down arrow to the right of the sender's name. So if you get a message from us, right, uh, you'll see a little down facing carrot or down facing arrow. Uh, if you click on that, there's several things that you can do. You can copy the address. You can send a new email. But at the bottom, you can search for email from Mac Geek Gab feedback. And it's a really handy way to just tell mail to search for all the email from one sender. So uh, that another quick tip. Thanks, Todd. Good stuff. It's great. I love it. Right? Good, John? Where'd that come from? I know. It's great. I never noticed that. See? Is it new? This Who is, knows? No, it's not new. That's been there for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But that's the beauty of these quick tips. Is you don't know until you know. Yep. Uh also in the quick tip category, Rich sends uh, this along. He says, uh, did you know that when you share a contact from your iOS contacts app via message or email, that anything you have typed into the notes field will not transfer? That stuff remains private to you. So there you go. I had no idea about that, uh, but that's a handy thing to know. Obviously, it's worth testing on your own so that you can. Right. share with confidence but um but yeah yeah i test i did test it on my own i didn't want to share this tip without uh, I, I, yeah i could imagine <laughs> oh not this jerk yeah exactly <laughs> right yeah put him on the blacklist or whatever it is and then oh yeah <laughs> get shared around oops you know <laughs> yeah so yeah yep yep so uh, and then one last one on the quick tips comes from listener Keith, who says, uh, I've had an Apple TV since the first version upgrading whenever a new one came out. And I've only just discovered this yesterday. Uh, oh, he says, uh, that, uh, yo, yeah. He says yesterday I serendipitously dropped something on my Samsung TV remote and it hit the pause button at the bottom. I was playing something on my Apple TV at the time. And it paused after some experimentation. I realized to my delight that the pause stop forward, backward navigation and enter keys on the Samsung remote work with the Apple TV. I always assumed that they were there and would only work with Samsung devices such as videos and, you know, DVD, Blu-ray players, etc. He says, I guess the Apple TV has a built in database of IR codes for different TV models and interprets them and works accordingly. That is true. Um, mm, it's never. also, what's that? Okay. Well, but it's also possible that you're getting this through the, um, CEC, the control channel via HDMI from your TV back down to your Apple TV. Uh, I think the Apple TV will respond to those commands, uh, via the HDMI connection. So it's, I, I don't know which is which, but I, I thought the Apple TV could, could do the remote stuff or is that, am I wrong about that, John? Well, no, it can. So let me go into some detail. So I've, I've dabbled with various, um, IR toys sure. over the years. So IR is infrared. So right, it's right, invisible right, light right. that the controls for a lot of things use, though not everything. Some use RF and uh, like TiVo uses both actually. Um, but here's the thing. They share codes. Is, is what's happening here. So so what happened here is that uh, there was an overlap with, uh, on the one hand, there are like hundreds of different remote controls and there's a database of those codes. That is true. But the thing is some, a lot of them are shared. Um, so you can reprogram. For example, I remember this, you know, I, uh, the TiVo, for example, it's like, well, hey, you know, point your remote at this TV and do this and that. And then, you know, I'll learn what brand of TV you have, and then I can control your other devices. 
right? Yeah, it could be. Um, without having paired it, though, I, I think it's actually doing it with HDMI CEC. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I found a I found a um, an article on Apple's site about HDMI CEC. <laughs> I th- I think that's how it's doing. It could it could be doing infrared. Um. Does the Apple TV even support infrared, though, now that I say that it did? Is there an IR port on it? Yeah, but I don't know if the um, new ones do. They might. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I guess what I'm saying is that um, infrared is a weird world. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. For sure. um, No, in that uh, once I spent the time, my TiVo remote controls all my other devices because you can set it up to do that. You can say, okay, learn or interact with another device and then figure out the protocol they're using. It's kind of a mess, but when it works, it works great. Yeah. 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 I want to send a big shout out of thanks to uh, the folks, some of the folks, well, all the folks really in our chat room at Mac slash stream specifically Feek and Clayton and Brian Monroe, who all helped chime in and and get that information to you so that we didn't have to wait until next week for a follow up. They helped make sure that we had that HDMI CEC and infrared information. So it it does the Apple TV support both IR and HDMI CEC. And uh, and thanks to you guys, we put some put some stuff there in the uh, in the in the show notes. What do we call them? At MacGeekab.com. It's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> show notes. Yeah. Show notes. That's what we I like hear. Them. Yeah. Uh, okay. One, uh, speaking of follow-ups, let's do a quick follow-up from two shows ago, which w- comes from Rob. Uh, and back in show 742, he said, I listened to it and your discussion about USB-C devices, et cetera. One bit I would like to add is that not all USB-C cables are created equally, uh, not just in terms of quality, but functionality as well. Uh, maybe other listeners were previous, previously aware, but I didn't realize there were USB-C cables that could offer both maximum PD charging up to 100 watts and offer the fastest data transfer rates in the same cable. In my research so far, I have found two but tried only one band, one brand without complaint. The J5 Create uh, has individual serial numbers per cable. Yes, it might be more expensive than the USB-C cable you were provided when you bought a device or can pick up just about anywhere. But for the negligible amount of additional money in the grand scheme of things, I prefer to buy just the best in class and be done with it so that I know regardless of what I'm connecting, I'm seeing the fastest charging and or transfer speeds currently possible. He says, I use the J5 cables to connect a Samsung T5 SSD to my 2018 MacBook Pro to charge my 2018 iPad Pro, etc. I don't know about you, but I still find the current state of USB-C to be a surprising hot mess for a connector that promises to rule them all. And it is maddening enough to sort out device capabilities, let alone cable capabilities. And I don't disagree. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for sending that in Rob. And, and there's a cable, this J five create cable, uh, that, uh, that he sent him. We'll put a link in the show notes. He also found one from anchor. Uh, and, uh, and I think, I think there's new USB C cables coming from anchor too. I just got a note about that today. And I think some might be on the way. So, um, so there you go. Uh, we'll put links to those two in the show notes mm. for sure. Um, and then, uh, then he says a bonus tip, Best Buy sells an 87 watt power delivery USB-C wall charger that has the cable permanently attached and sells for only 40 bucks instead of the 125 that you will pay Apple, uh, for their adapter and cable. I know it might be overkill for your MacBook air, but again, I prefer to buy ahead of the curve where possible, even if it's overkill. Yeah, it's not Apple OEM, but I don't think it has so much uh, Chinesium in it that it isn't safe. (laughs) Interesting term. (laughs) Uh, I consider it a great option for a spare charger or a charger to leave in locations where I don't use it as much. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes, too. Um, There you go. 87 watt PD uh, USB-C. So, yeah, USB-C. And I think you're safe as long again, as long as you get something that's that's certified uh, by, you know, some 
electric, you know, agency as opposed to not certified, but, um, it yeah. does, and it doesn't matter if it's, you know, UL or, or the, the, I forget what the European one is or whatever it is, but, um, but you know, getting something that's certified, I think you're fine. It doesn't need to be Apple certified specifically. It's USB C. It's straight ahead as long as it's not, uh, you know, just running nope. willy nilly. I think you're fine, right? So it's disturbing to hear advice on this nuance here because I remember when I got the USB C to Lightning cable, so I could do the PD charge on my iPhone eight. Mm-hmm specifically i was advised through numerous channels and I, I believe them that only the apple cable can handle the so i guess it 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 disturbs me that there are different capabilities on different cables to me that's as was pointed out i don't think that's right <laughs> um well it i think that is one of those things that's currently true but changing right because the apple yes. cables are the only ones that are certified at the moment but um but there are, uh, and I'm looking through my email while we're talking here because just yeah, really earlier today. Certified now to do the fast charge USB C thing. Yeah, but an hardwire. But Anchor's got some USB C um, yeah. cables sure. coming, but USB C to Lightning cables. But but they're a couple of months off. Like I, I think everybody is a couple of months off because we're waiting for Apple's approval. So that that starts to get okay. interesting. Yeah, I'm just saying it's. It's kind of weird. Well, I mean, it's lightning is the issue, right? It has to be uh, Apple certified. Right. And and this is why I'm I'm kind of bullish on USB-C because it's like, mm -hmm. as we just said, as long as it's USB-C certified, then Apple is adhering to the standard. You, you know, it's good to go. Everything just works, which is great. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. good. Good, good. Uh, where are we on time here? I don't know. I can never tell. I mean, I can tell. I, I have the capabilities of telling. I just, you know. Don't. We have the timer. We have a timer. Yeah. No, the timer actually does does a, right. a lot to help us. All right. Before we jump into Cool Stuff Found, I want to talk about our next sponsor, which is Cashfly at mac.cashfly.com. When websites don't load, we lose interest. You lose interest for each second a page takes to load. It costs a company almost 16% in engagement. I think it's actually more than that, uh, at least based on what we've seen at Mac Observer over the years. Fewer visits means fewer readers, fewer customers. That's not good for anyone. Cashfly has your back. Cashfly has had our back here at Mac Geek Gab for almost all of the 13 and a half years that we've been in existence making sure that these shows, these audio files get to you no matter where you are. And with their new web optimization capabilities, all of your content will be optimized before it's delivered to visitors without requiring any development effort from you. With the recent addition of Cashfly's flexible edge application platform and the related implementation services, their, ca their capabilities reach way beyond those of a traditional content delivery network. They're actually building some smarts in to this web content optimization solution and Cashfly in it includes powerful APIs for solving all of your content distribution problems on the fly, next generation image optimization, application load balancing and smart asset delivery. So if your website's directly tied to your revenue, and I'm pretty sure it is. Optimize your site's content now so that you can guarantee your users the best experience, no matter where they are or what device they're using. And here's the best part. The good people at Cashfly have something special for you because you're a Mac Geek Gab listener. They're going to provide you a free optimization consultation just for you. Free. They're going to look at your website, tell you what it needs. And you can then know exactly where your site stands today with a lighthouse score report and learn how Cashfly's web optimization solution can help add like 60 points instantly to your score. Visit mac.cashfly.com. That's M A C dot C A C H E F L Y dot com to get that free optimization consultation for your website. Our thanks to Cashfly, not just for sponsoring the show, but certainly for that. 
for offering this great thing to all of you and for doing what they've done for all of us here for many, many years. Thanks, Cashfly. Uh, very much so. Again, mac.cashfly.com. All right, John. Let's go to some cool stuff found. How's that sound to you, my friend? Fantastic. Fantastic. That's like landtastic with an F, isn't it? What decade do you live in? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Not this one. <laughs> no. Not if we're talking Land. about landtastic. Yeah. All right. Uh Paul reminds us, I love it, when there's a cool stuff found that we have yet to talk about on the show, and yet we use it for every episode. And Paul says, uh, I want to mention version two of loopback from rogue amoeba. Uh, he says the new interface makes it way easier to understand how sound is being routed. And this is what loopback does. We use it for the show here. Uh, so I, let's see, what's the best way to explain this? Oh yeah. So I, I have to take, um, my audio right in my microphone and our theme music, or if we're playing audio comments or anything like that. And I need to route that in such a way that not only can I record it for all of you, but John needs to be able to hear it all too. We use discord, but it doesn't matter if you use Skype or whatever, same problems, what needs to be solved. Discord and Skype have one choice for a sound input device. So if I assign my microphone to the sound input on discord, John would not hear any audio comments. And if I wanted to have him hear audio comments or music or anything, there's no sound input device that says, take the sound from this application and route it there. This is what loopback does. It lets you create essentially virtual pipes inside your Mac, right? So what I do is I output the sound from my audio app and, and I, and from my microphone, I route them using audio hijack, but it could use anything I wanted. Really. I route those into a loopback device. It creates a virtual audio device shows up as both an input and an output and whatever I route into it comes out the other end. And so that's what I put. I put a loopback audio device into Skype or discord as the microphone. And now because I have two things routed into it, my mic and the audio files, when I play like the theme music or whatever it is I'm going to play, everybody hears it, including John. That's what loopback does. And if you, if most of you will probably never need it, that's great. If you need it, man, it's the right tool to have. So thank you, uh, Paul, for reminding us to talk about that. It's pretty cool, huh, John? It's the intertubes as they were meant to be. It, it really is. It's yeah. Yeah, it's it, cool. It gives you more tubes, right? It, it gives you more tubes. It does. And, you know, so I can play uh, an audio file like, well, like this, for example, and and yet everybody hears it. Apple to forever, <laughs> life better and better. I don't know where this came from. So anyway, yeah, that's that uh, an actual Apple ad. I don't I know that. where that came from. I, somebody sent it to me or I found it somewhere. I don't know. But um, but you couldn't do this on the Apple II. Uh, maybe you could, actually, but loopback certainly didn't exist for the Apple II. Oh, I like those the, those tricky sounds at the end. That's pretty good. Anyway, right. thanks. Thanks, Paul. Good stuff. <clears throat> good. Yeah. Moving on to the next one. Where are we at? Uh, we are at the 43-minute mark is what we're at. But uh, I'm going to move us to Ollie. Because Ollie, um, where are we, Ollie? I know you. Oh, yeah. Oh, Ollie. Perfect example. Go for it, Ollie. Hi, Dave and John. This is Ollie sending a message from the UK. Just wondering if you've ever used the Asus Tor line of products at all. I have the A6208T, and that works awesome as a NAS drive, and you can put multiple different sized drives in it. Um, Ironwolf Pro I might go to drive for that. Just wondering on if you've ever come across these before, and if you haven't, I would definitely recommend giving them a try. Thanks for the awesome show. Thanks, Holly. Yeah, I had never, I didn't even realize that Asus or Asus, uh, I never quite know how to pronounce that company's name, uh, made, I knew they made motherboards and routers because we've been aware of those for years. Plan. What's that? It's right in front of me. 
You have a my display. Oh, yeah, they do make displays. I found that out at CES this year. I I met with Asus to to learn more about their routers and uh and then and then they showed me they have some killer displays coming. And and but they didn't yeah. even mention these NAS devices. So, there you go. Yeah, I I'm, I'm as surprised as you are, but um yeah. Asus Brian Monroe is saying and I think he's right. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it may not be their tubes, but who cares as long as it's pretty and it's right. pretty right see love yeah. it anyway so yeah these nas devices so there you go thanks ollie yeah oh wait well i think the notable brian, thing wait is brian that... monroe is is correcting me on something uh oh this is not asus it's it's a completely different company it's a oh. asus tour a s u s t o r thank you so much brian monroe got it now I know why I didn't realize this because it is two different companies. Excellent. Mm. Yeah. Okay. That makes way more sense. Asus Tour. A S U S T O R. Got it. Thanks, Brian Monroe. All right. Very good. Cool. So it seems their gig for their devices is that some of them have a gig or 10 gig on them. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. But it looks like they've got a decent uh, interface. It would be worth checking it out. So we'll we'll reach out to them and and learn more and uh, we'll Give let me. you know yeah. how it compares with with Synology and QNAP and all of that stuff. Got a lot of that stuff. Yeah. yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. This is why we love this show. It's great. We learn. We learn too. There you go. All right. Uh, one last cool stuff found is well from David. Uh, he says a listener mentioned. In the most recent episode, 743, transcoding his uh, VTS folders with handmake, handbrake, uh, he says, which I also use. But when doing tasks like this in bulk, bulk I, he says, I found a fork of handbrake called handbrake batch. And handbrake batch was, and I suppose still is, a little app that can take multiple folders or multiple files and queue them up into handbrake for you. But as of, I think about two years ago... Handbrake included batch capabilities within it so that you can point Handbrake at a folder and then you go to the file menu and say, you know, process everything and it will let you do that. You have to put in wildcards for the file names. We'll link to a tutorial as to how to make this happen. Uh, it's a, it's from the person who used to make Handbrake batch, but it hasn't been updated in I think it's four or five years now. So um, but it is a cool thing if you're doing lots and lots of stuff knowing how to put handbrake into batch mode, either with the native stuff or simply with, um, with handbrake batch. Cause it sounds like at least for David, it still works just fine. So there you go. Thank you, David. Good stuff. Fun. Have you ever yeah. used batch mode on any, any of that stuff, John? Um, not handbrake. Okay. Graphic yeah. converter. Oh yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Long time ago. Yeah. 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 When we were, Yes. In the old days, we yeah. were lovingly handcrafting our image pages. Oh, yes, that was crazy. Yeah, we would do these. We would use graphic converter like at when we were at Mac, Macworld Expo or other trade shows. <laughs> We'd take a bunch of pictures. Actually, I, I, I you know, I, we need to make sure you, we have you do that next year for CES to do like a photo tour of, of CES wherever no? you are each day. Right. That would be cool, right? Don't you don't you folks think that would be a cool thing to see? Because we can do that, and and we don't need to lovingly handcraft HTML from a graphic converter batch conversion, because um, you know we have web engines just built into WordPress that'll do that for us. I'm so. Pretty yeah, I'm pretty sure WordPress has something. Yeah, it's totally fine. It's it's fantastic. In fact, so you just upload them and say go. But um, really, do you think there's anything photo worthy at CES or in Las <laughs> Vegas? I think I think people would love to see, you know, here's what here. Well, think about this, right? The difference between like the main expo hall or even the sections of the main expo hall where the autos are versus where the TVs are versus where, you know, the like the, you know, iPhone, Mac, Apple tech stuff is. And then compare that to like the sands where. The, in the basement is the, uh, what do they call it? Eureka Park, where all the crazy, like, early stage companies are and the booths are smaller and, like, and even Pepcom. Like, we talk about going to Pepcom and events like that. Mm -hmm. People, I think people would like to see what Pepcom, yeah. what Pepcom looks well, like. So, some of our colleagues, such as uh, 
Allison, mm -hmm. Chuck tend more towards the video angle of things. But videos aren't the same, right? Videos. I mean, they're mm -hmm. doing interviews with videos. That doesn't necessarily give you a right, feel right. for like pictures, like a, a photo gallery can give you a feel for what things look oh, like. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Oh, I think that would be great. Yeah, man. We'll uh, yeah. revive that because yes. Yeah. I, I took a, a couple yeah. on Instagram. But, um, yeah. Get some group photos. Yay. I did do, I did do one video uh, of the, L really? I, I do it every year. I, I find whichever TV manufacturer's booth blows me away the most. And I take a video of it. And uh, for the last several years, that has hands down been LG's booth. Yes. And this year they had a bunch of curved uh, uh, OLED glass. It was really quite spectacular. Uh, so From what I've seen, that that they've there. also showcased their technology at some of the CEA events. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, if you're talking OLED, I think LG is, they know what they're doing. They do know what <laughs> they're doing. As far as I can see, yeah. and that I think they're one of the leaders in, the, in that space. So if you're looking for an OLED TV, you know, check them out. Yeah. I'm just saying, from what I've seen, they're pretty. They're pretty, for sure. Yeah. 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 It's gorgeous. Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Uh, let's see where we are at here. Oh, we, we have a question. Should we, yeah. should we do a question, John? That'd be a good thing. This, this no. deep into the show. Uh, no, listener, my answer is no. Mr. Michael oh, right. says, I use my early 2014 MacBook Air as something close to a desktop. I leave it plugged into power over 90% of the time. It says, and I use fruit juice to try and adhere to maintenance cycles. That said, uh, I usually keep a two terabyte glyph drive plugged into one USB port, leaving me with a single additional USB port. I'm constantly working with music and video files, listening, recording via a Roland Octa capture interface, watching music, teaching videos on DVDs through a USB Apple drive, etc. It seems like I am constantly pulling something out in order to add something new. Then, of course, there are times when I might want to watch a video, but also get my carbon copy cloner backup started. Yada, yada. My question is, what is a good multi-port adapter that I could use and thereby reduce some of the plugging and unplugging? I do occasionally break the air free, uh, but most not necessarily all of the wired devices. So I am OK with a portable hub that does not require power. But one that's designed for desktops and thus does require power would still be OK. All right. So here's the thing. That air is uh, if, if my my digging serves me and I think it does because I got it wrong and then got it right. When as I started digging on this uh, has two USB three ports and uh, and then it's got uh, a Thunderbolt port on it as well. So uh, uh, right, not Thunderbolt three, but Thunderbolt, I think it's Thunderbolt one, but the interface is the same. So you have a couple of options um, for if it's just US, if, if all you want to connect is USB, then I think a USB hub would do it for you. You want to get a USB three hub, but those are kind of become commoditized now, right? If, if you're just getting a hub. Uh, just go and, uh, you know, we there, there's some at Amazon. We'll, we'll put a link to one, um, but they've got, you know, Amazon basics. In fact, in fact, makes a, uh, a series of USB three or and USB two hubs. Make sure you buy the USB three one. They've got a four port for 17 bucks and a seven port for I don't know, whatever it is, 32. So, I mean, these, you know, these things are relatively inexpensive. Um, yeah. Just check the power. You would hope that the power output would be. Yeah. Yeah. So the a, a certain level, but just double check the power output to make sure that it's a, it's enough for what you need to do. I mean, you could take, okay, the maximum power on USB three is this and that and that, but you know, some vendors may uh, skimp on that. So, and, and take a look. Cause I think the four port one from Amazon basics will let itself be bus powered. And I think the seven and the 10 both required desktop power. So, you know, or not desktop power, separate power of their own with a, you know, a plug into the wall or whatever right. it is. And what we're saying is bus powered means the computer powers the hub, whereas you could have an external wall wart, as we love to call them, right, Dave? Yeah, that's what we call them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, check that out before you get a hub. Yeah. Um, 
So this is this is a twenty four. This is not the new MacBook Air. This is the twenty fourteen MacBook Air. So it's anything but the new MacBook Air. Essentially, is what this applies to. So, but but the other thing you need to be aware of when you're doing this is that that MacBook has a single USB chip in it. Okay, so if you are going to be doing a lot of data concurrently, you may not. Like, even though you could get a 10 port hub and plug in lots and lots of things, you may not get the bandwidth that you want or the uh, lower latency that you want, especially if you're doing audio stuff or anything like that. So you might want to add another USB chip to it. Well, how do you do that? Well, that's where Thunderbolt comes in. When you add a Thunderbolt device, it's it brings with it its own USB chip or perhaps two of them. If you're getting it from the right vendor and they have enough ports on it to warrant that. So I would, I, if you're going to do that, I would lean towards, um, th th there's essentially two ways to go. There's getting a Thunderbolt dock that has USB and of course, lots of other things, or there's, a, you know, a Thunderbolt dongle, but really it's just a mini dock. And, uh, I, you know, they, there's, there's two that, that I would recommend. The first is the OWC Thunderbolt two dock, uh, that will have its own USB chips in it. It will have, uh, and it's also got ethernet and, you know, everything else. I've actually got one of those running down on the iMac in the office because it's Thunderbolt two. And so it works great. And, but it may be more than you need. It's two, I think two forty nine or maybe two twenty five, depending on how the pricing works out. The other way to go, if you just want another USB port, but with its own chip, is the connects Thunderbolt to USB and also gigabit Ethernet adapter. Uh, I have one of these too. I used it for years with my old MacBook Air when I traveled, so that I had USB three and Ethernet with me, and it works great. Um, I don't, you know, it depends on what you need. Um, it's a little bit cheaper. It's like, I don't know, like a hundred bucks or something. So, uh, so there you go. Right. Good. Yes. So John? many options. Yeah, I know. I'm with you. I know. It's crazy. I gotta get one of these stocks. I haven't found a need, but, but I feel like I need to get one. Uh, yeah, it's cool having these, these, yeah, I can't imagine how you live with your Mac mini without like a Thunderbolt dock attached to it. That's crazy. Well, I do have a USB, uh, uh, uh who is it? I'm sorry. I do have a, uh, six or eight port USB three hub. So I'm not, I'm doing good and good. it's powered. Cool. So cool. Uh, yeah. All right. All right. Cool. Uh, no, I did have to get that because I did not have enough ports. And you know how it. that goes. Uh, yeah. All right. All your uh, wrangling, whatever you're wrangling. Yeah, I'm wrangling can, show notes uh, and all that stuff. What do you got there? Let me see. Who do I got here? Whose thing do I have? Via Labs. Hmm. Anyways, it's USB 3. So we're good. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. Coolio. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, now that I'm finished wrangling the show, oh, it's yeah. mid-show. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, okay. And then um, Les has a question. Let's see. Les. Uh, I will find it. I will oh, find it. There he is. He says, when trying to use my AT&T uh, Yahoo, now owned by Verizon mail account, I had to sign in using my email account and password. I checked the box saying to keep me logged in for two weeks. However, later that day, I went to check my mail and it asked me to log in again. I thought it was strange, but figured someone's servers were glitching. Now, the problem is happening with bank sites. I log in with my username and password, but I get the message that they don't recognize my computer. And have to answer a question or get a text. I'm using a MacBook Pro, which I've had for about eight months and have paid many, many bills through with these banks. Can you think of a reason why my Mac would randomly but frequently not be recognized? So, 
you know, usually the way this works is those sites leave a cookie behind in your browser to recognize you. So the mm -hmm. first thing to look at is that, right? Are you deleting your cookies or maybe running something that's auto purging them? Or are you running in private browsing mode, which doesn't let cookies persist past that session? Right. Or like, are you running an ad blocker, perhaps, because that may filter cookies. Just saying. Right. True. Very good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's what I thought. So the thing is, yeah, as Dave said, um, somebody saw something on your computer saying, hey, I know who you are. But if you come back and um, or even if during that you you have now it could be an ad blocker. It could be some other sort of anti. I mean, I don't know how far we can go here, Dave, but, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of software that could block the placement of a cookie, seeing it as a threat, but it's really not right. I mean, I'm yeah, yeah, it could be. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, that, that would be the, the first thing to check, right? Is, is what are you running? I mean, you could boot in safe mode. Um, that would be, uh, would that disable browser plugins or browser extensions? I can't remember if that does or not, John. Maybe not Apple. I don't know. Yeah. Or try it. Yeah. Try it. Well, you can always take a look, right? Go into Safari and go to um, preferences in the Safari menu and go to extensions and see what's running. And if there's something there that looks like it might be trying to block things, well, you know, that's what you want to remove. Right. I mean, site stopping, remembering the only other thing I could think of off the top of my head because I log in from multiple devices. Have you logged in from multiple devices? It may be confused by you doing that. I don't know. Yep. Yep. Just, yeah. 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 I don't know. It shouldn't be. The, the, uh, yeah, I get it. But still, I mean, something. So it's either something actively blocking the placement of the cookie or, as he said, I mean, this happens. I mean, I've had this happen, too, where all of a sudden one of my bank sites or secure sites says, huh? And I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I see it as when I log into a new one. Too often, in which case maybe somebody's like trying to hack you, but then you would think your bank or whoever would be like, well, yeah, we're kind of working on that. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I think he's got a cookie problem because it's not just one. Um, it's not just one site that he's having this with. It's many sites. So something is clearing out his cookies and you can check that. You know, if you visit a website uh, and you go, I guess you have to turn on the Safari develop menu menu to do this Ooh. first. Right. So Crazy. go to Safari preferences advanced. And at the mm. bottom of that screen, turn on show develop menu and mm. then. Uh, you go to show, well, I always, I always go this way, but I think there's probably a better way to go is, um, if you go to the develop menu and show page, it really doesn't matter. Um, show page resources or show page source. It doesn't matter what you choose. And then from that window, look at storage and in storage, you should see a folder on the left labeled cookies, flip it open. Click on the URL for the bank you, and you might only have one URL there, but you might have multiples um, and that will show you the cookies that are there and it will also show you when they expire. And this would be an interesting thing to check hmm. to see if those cookies are appearing and if they're persisting even. You can also look uh, less so, but you can look in Safari preferences privacy manage website data and you can search for your website there so if your bank is say citibank you'd type in city and you might see it city.com it has cookies and databases and local storage unfortunately you can't see that here you can't see the details you can just see that it's there or not but that would also be a handy thing to see if it's there you can remove them from here and maybe if it's corrupted that would work so uh, you know, uh, and to wrap it all up, Dave. Yes, in the develop menu, if all is lost, there's the empty caches selection. Oh, 
Yeah. Because sometimes your caches get corrupted and what used to be right is not. And, you know, you just got to reset the caches or empty the caches to get things in a right state. I've seen it. You've seen it, you know? Yeah. I mean, oh, for sure. Caches. I blame the caches. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it, it, right. Something's wrong. So it could be anything <laughs> and it could very well be caches. But I don't think it. I, like it's hard <laughs> it's always hard to trouble what are you laughing about what's the what am i missing no i'm just laughing because i'm having fun and it's uh <laughs> oh okay i i, I wasn't sure if i was discussion. missing something yeah yeah, yeah. No, okay no no yeah, you're yeah, not yeah. no I, my guess is as good as yours mm. that's the thing is it's tough to to test it's tough to test remotely but but this doesn't feel like a cash's thing this this mm. very much feels like a cookies thing and it honestly yeah. feels like you're in private browsing mode. Now, I, I think your idea of it being a, a plugin or an extension rather that is wiping these out, that that would make a lot of sense. And it is worth, even if you're not having any problems, just go into, I think we said this a couple episodes ago, go into Safari preferences extensions and just take a look at what's there. You might be surprised right. at, as to what you find. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And if you are, that's bad. What's that? If you are, that's bad. That's wow. true. Yeah, it's true. Let me, let me see what's in my yeah. store. See? While you do that, I want to talk about our third sponsor, John, which is BB Edit from Barebones Software. One of my favorite apps to use, and it is one of the first apps I install and launch every time I boot my Mac. It's always running. We use it to kind of help with the post-processing of the show notes. They have their text factories in there. They have a, the ability to count words. Of course, as you probably know, BB Edit is was originally built for programmers and is still very much a tool that is used for programming all the time. It'll sense what language you are uh, coding in, and it will softly highlight the text in different colors, but it doesn't actually change the text. It's just doing it on the fly in the in the view window. But when it saves files, they are just text files. There's nothing special about them. And that's a beautiful thing. But you can use it to open plist files. You can use it to uh, check for changes or differences between two files. It's super powerful. And here's the thing. You can go download it for free. You get 30 days of all the functionality for free. After those 30 days, uh, some of the functionality, some of the more, I'll call it pro functionality goes away uh, and well, unless you pay for it and then, and then you can get it right back. But a lot of the functionality that you would use probably sticks around. So it's worth going to check out. Just go get your free copy now, download the, it's a free copy. And again, the, the, the trial part is, is the pro features, but there are many, many good features that last beyond the pro trial. Uh, available to you for free. So go check it out. Barebones.com. Download BB Edit. Tell them we sent you. Tell them we love them. Uh, tell them you love us and 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 they'll love you. And that's kind of how it works. It's a beautiful thing. Our thanks to Barebones for sponsoring this episode. Barebones.com. All right, John. Let's see what uh what's next here. Cure it. Oh, in the in the um it stopped working category. We have Cure It Ooh. here with copy and paste that stopped working. As he described, he says, since the Mojave upgrade or around that time, I have lost command C and command V functionality. He says, I think it has to do with some utility like copy paste pro or something. I've deleted them, but it doesn't help. I've searched around. I've tried everything. I've shut down the computer, waited 30 seconds, restarted it. I've disconnected all third-party peripherals. I've reset my Mac's PRAM and NVRAM. I've reset the system management controller. None of it changed it. It says, I also did terminal and kill all keyboard, just in case pasteboard was still running and getting in the way. Didn't work. But right-clicking and choosing copy or paste does work. Please help. So there's a couple things to try in the troubleshooting category. I would say try booting in safe mode and doing this. That'll rule out any third party stuff very easily. Any third party extension that won't rule out third party hardware, uh, but it will skip all that extraneous and third party software on boot. So I would check that first. Um, 
If it works in safe mode, then you know it's a software issue. Okay. And then something like Lingon would probably be the thing I would go for. And we'll put a link in the show notes to Lingon. Lingon will, will let you check all of the sort of hidden, you know, launch D related startup items. And you might find something in there that, uh, that you say, Oh, I bet that's it. And even when you think you've like, if pasteboard is built to run all the time, if you kill it, it will relaunch and it will relaunch because launch D is telling it to. So by disabling that, if in fact, that's the problem with Lingon, it won't relaunch. So that that's something to, to bear in mind with all that stuff. Launch D is, is very good at its job, even sometimes when you don't want it to be. Um, so that's one thing. If it doesn't work in safe mode, though, it's entirely possible that your modifier keys have gotten replaced or switched. If you go into system preferences, keyboard modifier keys, there's a little button toward the lower right. You can see that you can reassign caps lock, control, option, command, and function, and you can swap them around. And this is here because some third-party keyboards, in fact, there were a bunch of Logitech keyboards for years, were option and I think it was option and command, but it might have been option and control were swapped on the keyboard. And so when you hit control, it would trigger option and option would trigger control. So you just come in here and swap them. And everything's good. Check this. Make sure the command key is the command key. That might also be your issue. Any other thoughts, John? Um, I think you're in the right place. So if you go to system preferences and then keyboard, look through the various panels, um, not just keyboard, but text, probably not so much, but shortcuts. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Sorry. Bless you. Sneeze deck. It's okay. Thank you. Or type. <laughs> So, um, especially in accessibility, there's a lot of weird stuff happening there, but app shortcuts. So anything that appears when you go to keyboard shortcuts on the left side there, just make sure something unexpected is not there. Um, that's about it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For that, but, um, but no, I'm with you is that you want to boot in a known state and safe mode is, is that, and if it goes away, then it's like, self-inflicted all right sorry about that john what were you saying i i stopped being able to hear you but now i can hear you again go um i guess in general i was just saying you know keyboard you know when you look at that section of yeah. system preferences there's a lot of different options there that could bring you down the wrong path so cool yeah that's it uh, yeah and that. and you know make sure check the simple things because because command c works only because in the edit menu Command C is assigned to copy and command V is assigned to paste. Just look in whatever app you're in and make sure that command C and command V are what are assigned in the, you know, in the edit menu. Uh, like that could be, that could be an issue, right? If it's, if it's not, if something else has taken over command C and command V in your menus or somehow copy and paste have been relegated to command option C or something like that. Or if you're running um, uh, like keyboard maestro, that can get in the way of this stuff. It, it no, shouldn't, no. but I mean, you can force it to. You can tell it to get in the way of this stuff. So that could be another one. Yeah. 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 I would think safe, safe mode would, uh, as they claim, should exclude any third party utilities. Yeah. So. That, oh, definitely. Safe mode would, would do it. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So there you go. Good. All right. Uh, moving on to listener Jeff here, John, because Jeff asks, uh, he says, I've been using app delete for a while to clean up the remnants of deleted apps, but it's kind of crashy and I have to make sure I launch it before deleting an app. What are good and free slash inexpensive apps that do this job? Well, uh, I, I like two apps for it and neither of which is free, but I, I think they're both reasonably priced for what they do. Hazel is one. Hazel does a lot of cool automation stuff. It basically kind of takes over from where Apple left us hanging with, with watched folders. But Hazel also has an app delete engine. And because Hazel is running all the time, 
when you delete something, it just pops up and says, hey, you just deleted this. Do you want to delete all these files? And you can pick and choose from there. So that's one. And then clean my Mac is the other uh, that will, you know, help kind of purge all that stuff. So those are the two I like, John. But wait, there's more. There is more. My favorite, Dave, which yeah. is free for the time being. So you can, I believe, throw them a contribution that I have. And you should if you like it, but it's called App Cleaner. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And are they up to date? Well, of course they are, because I'm just looking now on the update notice. And November 18th was the last update. All right. In which they updated it for Mojave dark mode support, because who doesn't want dark mode support? Um, personally, I don't, but I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> sure. And some other things, uh, but but it has smart features. If you throw things away, it will come up and say, oh, well, you want to get rid of this, but you do you want to get rid of all these other kind of supporting files that could clog your system? And it does that. So it has like a smart delete feature. So huh. I like that. So my hat's off to them. Um, that makes it. Oh, gosh. Well, App Cleaner. We'll link to it. Cool. In the notes. All right. Cool. <laughs> Uh, let's see. We have time for a couple of more. Um, I don't think we have, I, there's some APFS related questions that I, I want to go through, but I, I feel like we've, we don't have time for that today. So we will save those for next week. Um, we'll kind of go through, uh, well, we've got a couple others here. Uh, Ken brings us an interesting uh, tip and a question. He says, here's the tip. Said so my iPhone 10R recently locked up while trying to make a call. The phone was not completely locked. You could start some apps, but the phone could not be rebooted, nor could I get into settings. A call to Apple provided me a means of restarting the iPhone. And there is a special sequence that you have to go through on these non home button iPhones now in order to force them to restart. And I highly recommend that in addition to listening to this sequence that we're about to tell you that you do it on your phone so that when the moment comes, you have some semblance of muscle memory of having done this before. <laughs> so the idea is you tap up volume, down volume, then hold the button on the other side. So you're going to use all three buttons on the phone. You go up, down, and then hold. So it's that, and that's really it. Tap up, tap down, and then hold the other one until the phone reboots and you get the Apple logo. And I tried it. And now, hopefully, since I've done it and said it a few times, when the moment comes, I will be able to do this. But I have a feeling I'll forget. So there you go. Up, down, hold the side. There you go. That's the tip. Ken's question is, he says, I've been receiving text messages, but occasionally there is no notification no buzz, no musical sound, no, no noise, no nothing. The message is there, but who would know? That is until one looks at the phone for some other reason. It says this happens whether the sender is on an iOS device or not. So iMessage or, or, you know, just regular SMS. Uh, he says, any thoughts? That's a, I, I, I don't, I know I've seen this occasionally. I, I don't see it enough that I would consider it a problem, but I occasionally do look at my phone and it's like, oh, huh, there's some notifications that I know would have made a thing. Now, if the phone is in do not disturb, or if you're in theater mode or anything like that with your Apple watch, obviously, well, maybe not, obviously that will keep those notifications from buzzing you. If you have an Apple watch and it buzzed your watch and it thinks it buzzed, buzzed your watch. It will not buzz your phone. If you have a Mac that is connected to these things and it thinks that it has notified you on your Mac, it will not buzz your phone. The idea is that Apple really only wants to buzz you once and it tries to do it on the device that you are on at the time. Now, that may be the reason for some of this confusion. If it thinks, oh, if your Mac was awake, but you walked away, maybe it thinks you're still there. Maybe it thinks you have attention for a few more seconds or whatever the message comes in. I, I think this is the, the root of this issue is having multiple devices and Apple trying not to have all your devices light up at once. I, I will take this, by the way, because we use Slack a bunch for uh, for all the companies that we have. And you can set Slack to be more or less aggressive about its notifications. I have it set to be fairly aggressive and 
there are many times throughout the day where my phone will buzz after I've seen a message in Slack on my, you know, like on my Mac or whatever. And, and it's sort of, you know, it's like, what is my, Oh no, I've already seen that. Okay, fine. So I kind of like that Apple's trying to do this, but obviously it's, there's nothing perfect. I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think there's anything you can do to fix this, Ken. I, th I think this is part of the deal, unless you just don't sign your Mac into iCloud and have it do your messages or whatever. But that's probably not a trade you want to make. Certainly not a trade I would want to make. So there you go. I Thoughts still on? can't get Slack to work right. Okay. I get notifications from you and, yeah. and the staff on my iPhone. Yeah. I can't get them on my Mac. My MacBook Pro. I don't know. Huh. I, said, I wish you had, I, said, I wish you had told me this at CES because we could have gone through it. There are some interesting <laughs> things with Slack in terms of getting because because you can have different um, rules for notifications on mobile versus desktop. I'm almost so, certain I've set them up right in the you know, I've gone to the page and said, you know, send it to me on my Mac. And it's like it just won't. So, is is Slack running on your Mac? No, but then that's why it isn't running on my phone. Yeah, it is. Well, that, but your but phone's get, different. But, but no, but I get notifications on my phone. Correct. But I don't get them on my computer. If you're, if Slack's yep, not running, are, you won't get them on your computer <sighs> because your Mac doesn't support those types of push notifications that oh. way. Well, that explains that. Okay. Yeah. You got to, you got to have Slack running on your Mac in order for those notifications to show up. Yeah. But I don't need to. On my iDevice. Correct. Because your iDevice gets saying. pushed. No That's exactly what I've said. That's correct. Oh, right. yeah. Yep. Yep. So that yeah, just leave that. Slack, just leave Slack running and, and you're good to go. I do, however, recommend that you run an app like Marco Armand's quitter uh, to quit Slack once a day. Um, because, and I also recommend this for Safari because um, mm -hmm. those apps Safari and Slack especially will blow up RAM. You got it. Yep. Leaky, leaky, leaky. It's leaky, yeah. leaky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. solution is to run an app that quits the. Yeah. Oh, that's just so sad. No, it's great. I I have it set to no, quit them, it's, but it's a, but it's sad. It is, but but it works very well and solves this problem. But it, it solves the problem. But yeah, it's exactly. Like, yeah. It it shouldn't be a problem that needs to be solved. Yep. Yep. For if you're sure. Warning about problems that need to be solved well hit us yeah uh we told you how to email us uh what we did not tell you is if you're a premium listener uh we will remind you that premium at macgeekab.com is the address to which you can send all of your questions that we do prioritize those uh as a thank you for the direct support but we do also get through everything almost every week this week we did i'm actually proud of us we traveled. We were both at CES. We got through everything. So, I'm I'm I, I, I'm giving I'm giving myself I'm giving us a pat on the back for that uh, again. No, we'll get yeah. So, uh, you can check us out in the forums. Go to slash forums The community there is fantastic. You folks have way outpaced me. I can't keep up with everything there. That's what I love about it. It's like I try. But uh, I do see things that are tagged that I'm tagged in and, and messages, and I do try to get in there uh, at least once a day to kind of go through and and see what's going on. But you folks are answering questions before we can even get there. It's awesome. Someday John will participate in the forums. I swear to you, this will happen. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's my mission in life. So if you could, it's help on my with bucket that. list. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Good. Uh, check it out. MacGeekGab.com/forums. That's easy for me to say. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? I want to thank all of our sponsors for this episode. Of course, Cashfly at mac.cashfly.com. Barebones Software at barebones.com. LinkedIn Jobs at linkedin.com slash MGG. Smile in our podcast marketplace at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Ops Genie at OpsGenie.com. Eero at Eero.com slash MGG. Capterra.com slash MGG. Good stuff happening, folks. Send in your questions. Send in your tips. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, look, here's the thing. 
take your time, do what you got to do, take care of your shoes. That's an important one. But at the top of the list, most of all, at the very, very, very top of the list, don't get caught. Made up.